The Book of Judith is a deuterocanonical book. We've already been over that, uh, what the deuterocanonical books are, seven books and parts of two others, parts of Esther and parts of Daniel, and then seven books in the Old Testament that are not part of the Jewish canon or the Protestant canon. Judith is one of them, uh, <clears throat> just like Tobit was last week. Judith is, um, well, first of all, her name means just a Jewess. So in some ways she symbolizes the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. This book has um, kind of historical difficulties. I don't know if they're really difficulties, though. Um, they can be explained because it's simply historical fiction. Uh, so there's different names that are used of various historical figures, uh, but they're out of order, out of sequence. I mean, the time period is identified in the writing pretty explicitly as just after the Israelites returned from captivity in Babylon, which is the Persian period of history when they ruled the ancient Near East. So why would you have this Babylonian name of the king ruling at the time, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who we know was a Babylonian king. And it's further complicated because he's uh, mentioned as being, described as being the king of Assyria. So it's, it's totally out of order historically. So that makes you think that uh, you know, it's so scrambled in such a drastic way that this can't possibly be the intended meaning of the author to present this as a historical work because they're deliberately scrambling the order of things. You had the Assyrians first, the Assyrian Empire dominated. Remember, Israel, the ten northern tribes were deported. Uh, then you have the Babylonian Empire replaces the Assyrian Empire, and then the Persian period after the Persians conquer Babylon, and uh, then Cyrus, remember, sends the Israelites, or the uh, Jews, the tribe of Benjamin, and the Levites, and anybody, back to refound the city. So Ezra and Nehemiah was all about that. So this is taking place after the Babylonian captivity during the Persian Empire, but they're using this Babylonian king's name, Nebuchadnezzar, for an Assyrian king. It doesn't make any sense. So I think that's deliberate. It's either straight-up historical fiction, just a romantic story to kind of illustrate um, the story of Israel, um, who's been widowed in a certain sense. She has no bridegroom. Um, and this Jewess, Judith, kind of symbolizes that. So it's kind of just an uplifting story for the Jews uh, to restore their hope and promise in God's fidelity to his covenant. And, and she is a widow in the beginning of the story and remains one till the end of her days. And that is a kind of a symbol of the Jewish uh, situation now without a king, without the Messiah. Uh, they are kind of in this uh, widowed state in a certain sense, awaiting the coming of the bridegroom. Behold, the Lamb of God. Um, <clears throat> he who has the bride is the bridegroom, St. John the Baptist says. Uh, so Christ is the bridegroom. How can the wedding guests fast when the bridegroom is with them? Uh, he is the bridegroom. He is the Messiah. Uh, but this is a prior period of widowhood in a certain sense. The stump of Jesse has been cut down this tree during, you know, when the Babylonians uh, deported Israel, uh, the southern tribe of Judah, uh, kind of chopped down the Davidic line. So all that's left is a stump, and they're kind of widowed and awaiting the return of their bridegroom. So it's either historical fiction or it could be like a crypto history. So that means that maybe they're kind of, maybe just due to political... Uh, the political times, were they, were they under Persian, uh, rule at the time? Persian rule at the time, but you know, maybe this thing was written. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know when it was written, but it could have been written during the Mac period of the Maccabees. So, you know, there's just all speculation, but maybe it was written 
in a cryptic way uh, to describe Antiochus IV Epiphanes, this Seleucid Greek king who was persecuting the Jews. And uh, so they were in great fear of this guy, this tyrant dictator. So, you know, maybe it was really about him. And, and an actual historical event underlies this. I don't know. But uh, Beluthia, the town, the, the city where uh, Judith lives, that is under attack uh, by this Assyrian king, uh, there's no record of it ever existing historically, a city in Samaria named Beluthia. So it's, the whole thing is kind of mysterious, but uh, Beluthia, Bethulia, sorry, Bethulia, unknown city in Samaria. So it must have been a pretty big city set on top of a mountain, and no one knows what city this is, and it had to be pretty big because, uh, you know, this army had it encircled, and it had some defenses, and there was a lot of people living there that it posed enough of a threat um, to warrant uh, this, this uh, what do you call it, when, a, when you're surrounded? Siege. Uh, why would they lay siege to some little village? Okay, so it was a sizable city on top of a mountain, and we don't know where it is or we have no record of it. So anyway, it's kind of mysterious. Let's just say it's historical fiction. I don't know. But it's inspired. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's in our canon, and it was quoted by the early church fathers many times. Even though it's not found in the New Testament, one reference to it, uh, the early church fathers see a clear, explicit prefigurement or foreshadowing of the Blessed Mother, and so does the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Identify Judith with a type of Mary, a prefigurement or foreshadowing of the Blessed Mother, and just another evolution of God choosing the weak things of the world to conquer the strong. But we'll get into that. So um, she's a heroine of the tribe of Simeon. Uh, this Jewish heroine, man, and this is, um, and she assassinates this king, Nebuchadnezzar's great general. I'm sorry, not the king, but his great general, Holofernes. It's a great name. Intimidating dude. And he is the number one man, general, in command of this huge army that comes down to punish all these tribes and peoples and nations that have basically blown off Nebuchadnezzar and uh, disregarded him. And Holofernes goes down there and besieges these towns, these cities. And he is uh, overthrown by this woman, as we'll see. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, she's not introduced into the story till halfway through. It's 16 chapters long. The first seven chapters, you know, are just kind of about Holofernes, kind of setting up the conflict here, the drama of Nebuchadnezzar and his outrage at this rebellion and this rebuff by all these nations from Egypt and all around Moab and all, all of them are just kind of like dismissing him. And <clears throat> he is furious and sends this huge army down there under Holofernes. Uh, <clears throat> but then in chapter 8, Judith finally enters the story. She's not mentioned at all until chapter 8, verse 1, and then she enters the story. The rest, the whole second half of the thing is about her and her plans. So you kind of have this, that word plan keeps coming up in the thing, in the book. I didn't count exactly how many times, but I would say like six or seven times, the word plan. The plans of Nebuchadnezzar, the plans of Holofernes, and then the plan of Judith. Uh, so this conflict between the two the two plans. Uh, I like that because I love the word plan. Plans. The plan of God. Uh, it was a fascinating God's plan in salvation history. God has plans. We better get on board with the plan. Uh, <clears throat> so I like uh, that use of the word plan and this conflict between these two plans. Now, uh, let's see what else. It's not really in the lectionary hardly at all. It's got to be one of the most neglected books of the Old Testament in terms of the lectionary. Uh, the modern lectionary is hardly ever, ever 
in there. And so we hardly ever hear this story. And it's such a great story. Uh, she's a very virtuous and devout woman, so it's very similar to Tobit, you know. Uh, she's a really um, prescriptive person. I mean, somebody, somebody who is imitable. Uh, we can, you know, she's set f out there for us as an example to imitate. So she's a really saintly woman in many respects. We'll see when we go through the text. Then there's this guy, Achior, is another important character in the story. This guy, Achior, he's not Jewish and he converts. Uh, he knows the whole history of Israel and their identity as God's people. And discloses that to Holofernes. He goes to Holofernes and tells him about this people that he is making war against. And about their God. And about how his, their God formed them as a people from the very beginning. And the, they're all Chaldeans originally. And um, brought them out of Chaldea. And how they eventually wound up in Egypt. And so on. And were brought out miraculously by God. And then how they drove out these peoples from this land uh, that they claim for themselves and um, how God is with this people, but they have one Achilles heel, and that is that uh, God's protection of them is dependent upon their fidelity to his covenant. And if they sin uh, against that covenant, they make themselves vulnerable. So... Achior basically discloses all this intel to Holofernes and his other generals and stuff. They're all mad. His officers, they start complaining about this guy. Who the heck are you to tell us all this stuff and try to scare us off? Like, look, they're, these people are um, invincible as long as they remain faithful to their God. Uh, <clears throat> don't mess with this people. Uh, basically is what Achior is telling Holofernes. And Achior is a pious guy. So he gets rejected by all these officers. And they basically say, get out of here, you prophet. Who do you think you are? And they uh, basically they tie him up and they approach the city walls and, uh, and they leave him there. And then the... People of the town come out after the, you know, the soldiers leave and they find this guy tied up there. They bring him into the city. He tells them everything, what's going on and what he did and said to the general. And uh, they accept him and praise him. <clears throat> and he's welcomed into their fellowship. And then uh, What's cool is after the deed is done and this guy Holofernes is overthrown and he meets Judith for the first time, this heroine of the story, encounters Achior and they, Judith relates everything to Achior and they have this um, powerful encounter and he converts. He becomes a believer and he uh, remains so for the rest of his life and is brought into the covenant. It's, and his name Achior means brother of light. So, you know, the light of the Gentiles, you know, there's kind of a prefigurement or foreshadowing here of this um, extension. God's plan ultimately is to extend to all the Gentiles and bring them into the covenant. And so in this story, you know, you hear that you know, lots of Ruth, the story of Ruth or Rahab, you know, the story of Joshua, uh, this woman in the city of Jericho that gave assistance to the Israelites. There's different examples of Gentiles who are brought into the covenant that play pivotal key roles. And uh, this guy, Achior, is just another example of that. It's really cool. So he figures prominently in the story. Interestingly, his name means brother of light because he's kind of enlightened when he uh, receives the gift of faith. So let's get into the actual story now. Judith. All right. So Nebuchadnezzar is mad. The whole region disregarded the orders of Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Assyrians, and refused to join him in the war, for they were not afraid of him, but looked upon him only as only one man. <clears throat> and they sent back his messengers empty-handed and 
shamefaced. So then his uh, nobles get together and he has this, he devises this secret plan. Uh, his plan, Nebuchadnezzar, and he accomplishes it by calling Holofernes, the chief general of his army, second only to himself, and says to him, Look, thus says the great king, the lord of the whole earth. <clears throat> Go and attack the whole West Country because they disobey my orders. Tell them to prepare earth and water for I am coming against them in my anger. And I like that earth and water, you know, because if this is if this is like crypto history, and this is really, I don't know, Xerxes or something, um, you know, which we'll hear about in the book of Esther. Yeah, I, I just can't help but think of uh, the movie 300. I doubt any of you have seen that maybe, but it's like... An awesome movie, and I think if you can stand the violence, uh, about the 300 Spartans who hold off Xerxes' army for a period of time, and this heroic stand <clears throat> of 300 soldiers, Spartans. So anyway, uh, it begins with uh, the emissary of the king of Persia, Xerxes, the great Xerxes, sending uh, this emissary to Sparta, goes to the capital with the heads of all these conquered kings, all these skulls with crowns. This guy like rears up on his stallion and like displays this for all the city, all the people, shows them. And then he uh, has an audience with the king and <clears throat> tells him, all King Xerxes asks of you is earth and water. Earth and water. So anyway, a symbol of your submission to him as Lord of all the earth. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, they got that from the Bible because it's right here in the book of Judith. Uh, <clears throat> King Nebuchadnezzar asks for earth and water <clears throat> from these peoples. Um, all right, so let's see. Skipping ahead a little bit, uh, this huge <clears throat> army and all these other people, like a swarm of locusts, go down into the land and um, they run uh, into these Israelites. And these people and all in the country round about welcomed, some of them welcome him and they actually worship Nebuchadnezzar only. And uh, they cave, you know, and all their tongues proclaim Nebuchadnezzar to be God. So this is a very, the theological tension here is obviously pretty strong. Uh, <clears throat> By this time, the people living, the people of Israel living in Judea heard of everything that Holofernes, the general of Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Assyrians, had done to the nations. And they were terrified and alarmed both for Jerusalem it's kind of the backstory of this. Jerusalem is kind of behind Samaria now. So this army is coming. He's got to get through this line of defense. This city of Bethulia is kind of standing in the way of their approach to Jerusalem. Uh, so, <clears throat> so the people in Jerusalem are terrified for the temple. And... Uh, it says explicitly, explicitly right here, they had only just returned from captivity. They had only recently returned from captivity. So there's the historical setting. Very explicit. It gives us uh, this time period. Uh, Post-Babylonian exile and after the return, after Ezra and Nehemiah, during this period of the restoration. Um, so they convoked this Senate to discuss this in the city of Bethulia now, <laughs> up in Samaria. And this word Senate is uh, kind of um, very much like the Sanhedrin in Jesus' time. Uh, this Senate of the elders. And they all cried out and there was a great deal of fasting, sackcloth and ashes and prostrations and prayers. It's very powerful, you know, um, <clears throat> where we get these practices from. The Old Testament. Man, we're going to hear a lot about fasting and ashes and sackcloth tonight in both Judith and Esther. These... Uh, these two desperate situations, predicaments, Israel finds itself in, and these two women, these two heroines uh, tonight, and how the people humble themselves in this way, in this powerful, powerful way. Uh, <clears throat> and what happens as a result of this? 
The Lord heard their prayers and looked upon their affliction. So it works. God is drawn to the humble. If we humble ourselves in sackcloth and ashes uh, and prostrate ourselves, if it's real, God listens. God responds. It's a very, very powerful fasting and humili humiliating ourselves. So <clears throat> now, Akior intercepts Holofernes. He is the leader. He was the leader of all the Ammonites. And he says to Holofernes, look, this people is descended from the Chaldeans. At one time, at one time they lived in Mesopotamia because they would not follow the gods of the fathers who were in Chaldea. For they had left the ways of their ancestors and they worshipped the God of heaven. I like this phrase, the God they had come to know. Can't help but think of uh, our Lord's words to the Samaritan woman at the well. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. You can't know these gods because they don't exist. These pagan deities. Uh, <clears throat> God is a real living person. Uh, and exists, is existence, and he's knowable by us. Uh, and they, I, I, that's just such a powerful theological statement. This God they had come to know. Um, then he tells the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and basically the you know the sojourn in Egypt for four hundred years, and then the Exodus event, and then. Look, uh, as long as they did not sin against their God, they prospered. For the God who hates iniquity is with them. Boy, is that fascinating or what? You know, that's what sets the Israelites apart. And that's going to be a theme we're going to get into in the book of Esther big time. Um, yeah, that this is a unique people on the face of the earth and a unique religion on the face of the earth up to that time in many respects, because God takes human action and conduct very, very seriously. Who else? What other great nation has a law like this? Uh, what other God has revealed his ways to them in such, such great detail? Um, <clears throat> and it just sets the Israelites apart. It has a ring of divine truth about it, uh, that this is the one true and living God. And the one true religion on the face of the earth uh, that has revealed this God has revealed himself to this uh, people. So, Achior explains to Holofernes, look, uh, if you want to defeat this people, you're going to have to find a way to, for them to break their covenant. And... Um, <clears throat> Otherwise, forget about it, because uh, we will go up, uh, and the Lord will defend them, and their God will protect them, and we shall be put to shame before the whole world. So forget about it. There's no hope. So the officers are just furious. He must be put to death. We're not going to be afraid of the Israelites. They are people with no strength, no power for making war. And who are you, Achior, to prophesy? Who is God except Nebuchadnezzar? Oh, man. <laughs> they are setting themselves up by saying this. You just like cringe when you hear him talking like this because it's like pride cometh before the fall. Their God will not deliver them. They cannot resist the might of our Calvary. Uh, go talk to the Egyptians about that one. Uh, so says King Nebuchadnezzar, the Lord of the whole earth, for he has spoken and none of his words shall be in vain. This is such incredible blasphemy, such emptiness and vanity. You shall not see my face again from this day until I take revenge on this race that came out of Egypt. And they kick Achior out and send him bound over to uh, Israel. So they untie the guy once they get him inside the city. And take him to the elders, the magistrates of the city. And, uh, <clears throat> O Lord God of heaven, behold their arrogance and have pity on the humiliation of our people and look this day upon the faces of those who are consecrated to thee. 
So, you know, they're, um, they get a picture of what's happening out there from Akior. So then they have this plan. Okay, look, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to attack this city. So after all their blustering, you know, we're not afraid of the Israelites and their God. Now they're like, yeah, hey, let's just hang back. You know what? Let's just hang back and we're going to surround the city and let them die of thirst. Uh, we're going to cut off their water supply. And, I mean, it dang near almost works. Uh, so <clears throat> what's cool is, you know, this is... Uh, uh, it's like God allows them, them meaning, you know, these people, these Israelites, to reach the extreme limits of their strength to make it clear that it's not them but Him uh, that is going to bring about this victory uh, because it gets down to the end, man. We're 34 days into this thing, and all the vessels of water are like empty. They've been rationing it out to themselves. And their courage is failing. They're at their wit's end. The people are crying out to the Lord their God. Their courage failed. There's no way of escape from their enemies. And they start, kind of reminds you of like, you know, the wilderness wanderings. You know, it's constant grumbling and complaining. And uh, they just kind of relapse into that. And they cry out uh, to the leaders. You have done us a great injury by not making peace with the Assyrians. For now we have no one to help us. God has sold us into their hands. I mean, they're just despair, on the verge of utter despair. And they're clamoring that you should now call them in and surrender the whole city, this army. Okay, we can't carry on like this anymore. We'll just be slaves. At least we're not dead. We'll just be their slaves. And this huge general lamentation arose throughout the assembly, and they cried out to the Lord God with a loud voice. But then Uzziah is the king, and Ur is the ruler here, and he says, Look, have courage, my brothers. Let's hold out for five more days. By that time, the Lord our God will restore to us his mercy, for he will not forsake us utterly. He could have never known how true his words were. So that's a great act of um, faith there by this Uzziah. But the people were greatly depressed in the city. Man, have you ever been really, 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 really thirsty? Oh my gosh, it's maddening. Uh, I can only think of one time where I was like insanely thirsty. It was like just this all day march with canoes and packs through this wilderness in Minnesota trying to get to this lake crashing through the uh, without a path, without anything, just through the woods for 10 hours and then I was on Outward Bound and the girl forgot to fill the water bottle. It was her responsibility, this one girl. So we didn't have water and we were waiting to get to this lake. All I could think about, all I could think about, it's all consuming, is getting to that lake so I could drink that water out of the lake. Uh, you can drink it right out of the lakes up there, but I mean, I just was insanely thirsty the whole day, this incredible exertion to move Four canoes and nine packs through the woods, crashing through the woods with a compass. Uh, nine of us. And, um, oh my gosh, thirst will destroy them. Uh, <clears throat> that's what the, uh, the army of Holofernes says, you know, but, uh, but it doesn't work. It's not going to work because after all that buildup now and you've reached this crisis, this point of total crisis and despair. At the end of chapter 7, the people are depressed. And then I love this next line. Chapter 8, verse 1. At that time, Judith heard about these things. Dun, dun, dun. Judith heard about these things. When I hear that, I can't help but think of David and Goliath. Because that's a great example of another great example of like weakness overcoming strength. And and I love in First Samuel 17. It's like everybody's terrified of Goliath. And he's up there shouting all these blasphemies against the uh, army of Israel. And uh, <clears throat> David leaves the things in charge of the bag, you know, the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks. 
You know, his brothers had kind of like marginalized him. Stuck him with the baggage train. And, uh, but he gets up early in the morning and he, uh, he goes all the way up there, makes his way up to the front lines. And David heard him, namely Goliath. David heard him. That is a chilling statement. David heard him. And you just see this like wrath of David, like this wrath uh, that he feels because of his love of God. And he's hearing God being blasphemed. And uh, <clears throat> Judith heard about all these things now, and she enters the picture. And uh, Judith it describes her a little bit. What a great woman she was. Judith had lived at home as a widow for three years. And she set up a tent for herself on the roof of her house. So she didn't even live in the house. Lived in a tent. And girded with sackcloth about her loins and wore the garments of her widowhood. She fasted all the days of her widowhood. Yeah, there would be a period of mourning, uh, but then it would come to an end. But not so for Judith. She just continues and persists in this state of mourning and grieving, uh, living in a tent and wearing sackcloth uh, <clears throat> and fasting. Um, and she was beautiful in appearance and had a very lovely face. She was a knockout. No one spoke ill of her, for she feared God with great devotion. When Judith heard the wicked words spoken by the people against the ruler, because they were faint for lack of water, when she heard all that Uzziah said to them, she said, all right, all right, listen to me. And she's not only, she's not only gorgeous. I was going to say drop dead gorgeous. You know, that would be fitting and appropriate in this context of the story of Judith. She is drop dead gorgeous. Maybe that's where that expression came from. We'll see as the story plays out. She is, in fact, literally drop-dead gorgeous. And uh, she's also incredibly wise. She has great devotion. She's very wise and well-spoken. Listen to me, rulers of the people of Bethulia. What you have said to the people today is not right. Who are you that have put God to the test this day and are setting up Setting yourselves up in the place of God among the sons of men. You're putting the Lord Almighty to the test. Well, you'll never know anything. You cannot plumb the depths of the human heart, nor find out what a man is thinking. How do you expect to search out God who made all these things and find out his mind or comprehend his thought? Whew, I'm preparing the book of Job already for next weekend. It's like, wow, this is like, very much like a theme running through the book of Job. Uh, <clears throat> kind of a, anyway. Do not try to bind the purposes of the Lord our God, for God is not like man to be threatened, nor like a human being to be won over by pleading. Therefore, while we wait for his deliverance, let us call upon him to help us, and he will hear our voice if it pleases him, because we know no other God but him. We know him. All this he will bring about. Uh, okay, don't forget the whole slavery thing. You don't want to be slaves, folks. Uh, you're not going to want that. Look, in spite of everything, listen to the wisdom of her words. In spite of everything, let us give thanks to the Lord our God who is putting us to the test as he did our forefathers. Remember what he did with Abraham and how he tested Isaac and what happened to Jacob in Mesopotamia and Syria while he was keeping the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother. For he has not tried us with fire as he did them to search their hearts, nor has he taken revenge upon us. But the Lord scourges those who draw near to him in order to admonish them. Wow! Really profound wisdom flowing out of this woman of God. Uh, this is uh, something reiterated in various places. He heals, he rends and tears, but he also heals. Uh, you'll hear that in the prophets, Hosea. Uh, and it's right here in the uh, book of Revelation too. Uh, Those whom I love, I reprove and chasten, so be zealous and repent. 
sign of his love if he's chasing us or disciplining us like a father disciplines his son. So many examples we could look at, but this is a great thing, a uh, powerful spiritual principle here she lays out. The Lord scourges those who draw near to him in order to admonish them for our own good. It's for our own good. This discipline is good. It's healing for us. Now, uh, Uzziah says to her, all right, the people were very thirsty and they compelled us to do this for them. What well, we have promised and made us take an oath which we cannot break. Sounds like Aaron making excuses. Look, you know, the people compelled me and I threw some gold in the fire and this calf jumped out. You know, and it's just like <laughs> they caved to pressure and now they're trying to defend themselves and it's kind of pitiful. Uh, Judith said to them, listen to me. I'm about to do a thing which will go down through all generations of our descendants. Only do not try to find out what I plan, for I will not tell you until I have finished what I am about to do. This is great suspense. It's a great story. It's really, really a good read. This and the book of Esther. Both of them are just incredible. And Tobit. These are gems in the Old Testament. Judith fell upon her face, put ashes, and gets with the ashes and the sackcloth again. And, and she cried out to the Lord with a loud voice. And she goes on and on in this long prayer. Thou hast designed the things that are now and those that are not to come. Hold on. Thou hast designed the things that are now and those that are to come. Yea, the things thou didst intend came to pass, and the things thou didst Thou didst will presented themselves and said, Lo, we are here. For all thy ways are prepared in advance, and thy judgment is with foreknowledge. Uh, this is incredible, profound the theology. Her understanding of God uh, is really profound. Um, all kinds of interesting stuff in this prayer I can't go into, but uh, basically... Um, <clears throat> Behold their pride and send thy wrath upon their heads. Give to me, a widow, the strength to do what I plan. By the deceit of my lips. Uh-oh. Now we get into attention in the story. Judith lies. She lies to Holofernes. You know, her plan involves deceit. So there's a moral quandary here. What do we do with this? That's uh, the inspired word of God. Are we saying it's okay to lie sometimes? The end justifies the means. Okay, lying is intrinsically immoral, but are we allowed to do it in certain cases? Uh, very interesting. So, should I address that now? Yeah, okay. Uh, so she says it right here. I'm going to lie. It's premeditated lying. The whole thing is planned, uh, planned a planned deception of Holofernes, um, <clears throat> and um, I'll just say what St. Thomas Aquinas says is pretty balanced viewpoint. St. Thomas Aquinas, basically, in talking about lies and deceit, and he talks about Judith, and he says, you know, um, we're not praising her for lying. She's praised at the end of this thing, you know, to the heavens, Judith. This great heroine uh, is praised. But for her general virtue, like that she's willing to put herself out there on the line, her life on the line for the to save the people. It's not praise for her lying. So, yes, she's praiseworthy even though she did lie. She's still praiseworthy, St. Thomas says. Um, <clears throat> but... Yeah, there's no way to get around the fact that uh, there's something, you know, wrong about what she did. Um, but St. Thomas is good. He's very nuanced because he's like, well, look, you know, we don't know the mysteries of God's word. Uh, maybe even in her lying, there's a higher meaning. I don't know what that meaning is, but um, to this deception, to this um, that... Uh, Maybe it could point to something else, a further, greater fulfillment. Uh, so it's not prescriptive that we ought to lie because Judith does it and is praised for it. 
Uh, there's no way to justify that. Um, but she's still virtuous and praiseworthy. So that's how Thomas kind of threads the needle. Says, um, because it's unavoidable here, this quandary. By the deceit of my lips, strike down the slave with the prince and the prince with his servant. Crush their arrogance by the hand of a woman. For thy power depends not upon numbers, nor thy might upon men of strength. Thou art God of the lowly. We see that so many times. Remember Jael driving the tent stake through Sisera's forehead into the ground. I mean, some rough stuff, man. And I uh, gave him some milk to drink, got him to sleep, and wham! And then uh, remember the story of Gideon and the 300, you know, at night with the jars and the torches and the bam, and they blow the trumpets. And it's like, uh, and God's like, look, he pairs down the army to 300. It's uh, stories of David and, Gol and Goliath. I mean, over and over again, God demonstrating his power and might by choosing the weak things of this world, the shame, the proud, and the strong. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, it's awesome. This is a pattern throughout salvation history all the way to Christ coming and overthrowing all the forces of evil and the kingdom of Satan by his humility and powerlessness, seeming powerlessness, because it is when we are powerless that we are strong, St. Paul says, or God says to St. Paul. Um, so anyway, make my deceitful words to be their wound and stripe, for they have planned cruel things against thy covenant and against thy consecrated house and against the top of Zion. Okay, so she really is like thinking about Jerusalem, and you're going to see they're going to, have a big party in Jerusalem after this whole thing's over. So Jerusalem is back there. She's protecting it against the house possessed by thy children. And cause thy whole nation and every tribe to know and understand that thou art God, the God of all power and might, and that there is no other who protects the people of Israel but thou alone. Now she dolls herself up. And... <clears throat> What's kind of cool is uh, in this description in verse 4, chapter 10, verse 4, and made herself very beautiful to entice the eyes of all men who might see her. And that's not purely sensuality. With the mascara and, the, and whatever, and puts on the war paint and uh, <clears throat> fixes up her hair. And then she... Uh, she goes out there. Now, what's kind of cool is in the Vulgate translation of St. Jerome in the 4th century, the Latin translation of this, when Jerome translates it, uh, he adds a little something to verse 4. Now, where he's getting that, he had access to texts. And it's kind of tricky to figure out where, uh, you know, where is this story written? Was it written in Hebrew or Aramaic? I mean, there's Greek translations of this. I don't know what translations he had uh, at the time in the 4th century, but for whatever reason, Jerome in the Vulgate added this, uh, and, the, and the Lord also gave her more beauty, because all this dressing up did not proceed from sensuality, but from virtue. And therefore the Lord increased this, her beauty, so that she appeared to all men's eyes incomparably lovely. So there was something that just ravished them, and maybe it was because there's something different about her. Her beauty arose from virtue. Uh, there was a godliness about her beauty that was even more attractive. Wow! That's a great message about chastity to our world and modesty. So she wasn't wearing tight pants and, you know, whatever, showing cleavage and all right I'll shut up but uh, bottom line is you know it wasn't all about just titillating the men and getting them to uh, ooh la la uh, she was beautiful in a way so much more profound and sublime than that and there was something about that that just um, it's holy and good so they greatly admired her beauty, and she, uh, she worshipped God. 
she goes outside the gate. Now, the, you know, the people of Israel are admiring, greatly admiring her beauty. She hasn't even left the city yet. Then she goes out the gate. And they're just like, in all this woman, this is like day, whatever. This is like in the five days, five last days of this whole thing, siege. And she goes out there. And when the men heard her voice, her words, and observed her face, she was in their eyes marvelously beautiful. These are the Assyrians now. And they marveled at her beauty. And they admired the Israelites, judging them by her. And everyone said to his neighbor, Who can despise these people who have women like this among them? Dang. Surely not a man of them had better be left alive, for if we let them go, they will be able to ensnare the whole world. That's pretty incredible. At the sight of this woman, they said that. Like, oh my gosh, we better wipe these people out. They're going to take over. This is unbelievable. Look at this. Um, they all marveled at the beauty of her face. Uh, chapter 11. She says, I will tell nothing false to my Lord. God will accomplish something through you, and my Lord will not fail to achieve his purposes. Ooh. She's saying this now to Holofernes. She has an audience with the general, and she says that to him. That's where Thomas is like, there's irony in this, so is she lying, or is she almost kind of telling the truth that God is going to fulfill his purposes? <laughs> God is going to achieve... My Lord will not fail to achieve his purposes. I don't know. It's just kind of mysterious. There's like irony in what she's saying a little bit. For we have heard of your wisdom. Now she's going to butter him up like crazy, man. And he's just uh, soaking it up. For we have heard of, all, of your wisdom and skill. And it is reported throughout the whole world that you are the one good man in the whole kingdom. Thoroughly informed and marvelous in military strategy. And he's like, Our nation cannot be punished, nor can the sword prevail against them unless they sin against their God. So basically she says, look, they are sinning against their God. They've conceived a plan. She tells him that they're going to break the covenant. They're going to eat things that they're not supposed to. They're going to do some stuff up there in the city because they're at their wit's end. They're going to break the covenant. Now's your chance. Uh, and they marveled at her wisdom. And there's not such a woman from one end of the earth to the other, either for beauty of face or wisdom of speech. Wow! They are impressed with her. If you do as you have said, your God shall be my God, and you shall live in the house of Nebuchadnezzar and be renowned throughout the whole world. Those are the words of Holofernes to her. That's unbelievable. He tells her, look... Uh, if this is all correct, what you're saying, and, and this works, and we route this, these people, uh, your God shall be my God. Well, he's going to meet God very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> she remained in the camp for three days. I always see that three days, and there's a lot of repetition in the scriptures, both old and new, of this like three days. And she went out each night and blah, 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 prayed to the Lord her God to direct her way. Uh, <clears throat> now, Judith, he, he, he's getting uh, kind of um, you know, locker room talk amongst the soldiers. Like, you know, they all want to know if he hooked up with her. Okay. And uh, he's like, no, you know, and uh, not yet. So then, uh, you know, they, want, they all want the scoop, like, and <clears throat> if we do not embrace her, she will laugh at us, you know. She's like, uh, this is just classic. Judith came in and lay down in Holofernes' tent, and his heart was ravished with her, and he was moved with great desire to possess her, for he had been waiting for an opportunity to deceive her ever since the day he first saw her. But then he got liquored up and he drank so much wine he, he had ever drunk in any one day since he was born. 
He had so much wine, he passed out in the tent. And Judith was left alone in the tent with Holofer, and he stretched out on his bed, for he was overcome with wine. Then Judith, standing beside his bed, said in her heart, O Lord God of all might, look in this hour upon the work of my hands for the exaltation of Jerusalem. For now is the time to help thy inheritance and to carry out my undertaking for the destruction of the enemies who have risen against us. Give me strength this day, O Lord God. And she struck his neck twice with all her might and severed his head from his body. Then she tumbled his body off the bed, throws it in a basket, and then she gets her servant and they take off. Goes to the gates, open up, look, look what God did by my hand. He showed his strength against our enemies even as he has done this day to show his power to Israel. They, were, they just found it unbelievable that she had returned. And she says, this is great. Praise God, oh praise and praise God, who has not withdrawn his mercy from the house of Israel, but has destroyed our enemies by my hand this very night. It was my face that tricked him to his destruction, and yet he committed no sin, no act of sin with me to defile and shame me. So Uzziah comes to her and says uh, some cool stuff that sounds an awful lot like Elizabeth to the Blessed Mother. O oh, daughter, you are blessed by the Most High God above all women on earth. Your hope will never depart from the hearts of men as they remember the power of God. May God grant this to be a perpetual honor to you and may he visit you with blessings. Because you did not spare your own life when our nation was brought low, but have avenged our ruin walking in the straight path for our God. And all the people said, so be it, so be it. Now she encounters Achior in chapter 14. And he fell on his face and his spirit failed him. When they raised him up, he fell at Judith's feet. Blessed are you in every tent of Judah and every nation. Those who hear your name will be alarmed. He says to her, And when Achior saw all that God had, the God of Israel had done, he believed firmly in God and was circumcised and joined the house of Israel, remaining so to this day. Pretty cool. All right, now uh, they go to wake up the general in the morning, <clears throat> find out he's got his, he's missing something. And, uh, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, and uh, they're thrown into alarm and the Israelites come out of the city and they're all poised and ready. And they rout the army and they jump on the spoil and they, you know, they have all this uh, spoil of war. Now, uh, then they bless her. You know, they're so happy. Everybody's, ex you know, just extolling Judith to the skies. You are the exalt exaltation of Jerusalem. You are the great glory of Israel. You are the great pride of our nation. You have done all the single handed you have done great good to Israel, and God is well pleased with it. May the Almighty Lord bless you forever. And all the people said, so be it. If you can't see the prefigurement of the Blessed Mother here, when we get to the other side, uh, how she's going to be exalted, and we're all going to be standing around, so be it. You know, uh, She uh, did more than just overthrow some general, some piddly general at some point in human history in some corner of the earth. She overthrew the prince of evil, the prince of darkness, and drove a tent stake through his head, crushed his dang head. Uh, that is, uh, she is the woman truly blessed forever. She took branches in her hands and gave them to the women who were with her, and they crowned themselves with olive wreaths, wreaths, and she and those who were with her, and she went before all the people in the dance, leading all the women, while all the men of Israel followed, bearing their arms and wearing garlands and with songs on their lips, and they got tambourine cymbals, and they're singing a psalm. Uh, again, more of this uh, festive, joyful celebration, liturgical uh, worship, uh, very much Davidic, uh, the influence of David's liturgical reforms or renewal. Um, so anybody that says, oh, you know, there's no place for a tambourine or drums or anything other than an organ in a church, and we can only sing Gregorian chant. I get that. I appreciate that's part of our liturgical patrimony. I love all that stuff. 
uh, but they just disparage stringed instruments and say this has no part in our liturgy and this is degrading the mass and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, read the Old Testament, man. They were banging on lyres and harps and stuff and clashing cymbals and banging on tambourines and things and dancing around and they had their arms up in the air. It sounds like charismatic style worship to me. So I got a problem with people who just have this rigid, freaking fixed notion It's um, of liturgy. All right. I'd like to say a whole lot more about that, but I love it all. And uh, as long as it's solid and orthodox, uh, but within orthodoxy, there's room. In orthopraxy, there's room for these different forms or of liturgy, of liturgical worship. Having gone to a charismatic university to say, oh, it's just a bunch of emotion. I mean, there's no emotion in Gregorian chant. When you're in Mass, in the solemn Latin high Mass, you're telling me you're, you don't feel emotion when you hear all that? There's no emotion? It's just, I feel tremendous emotion when I hear chant. And uh, the reverence that you feel in your heart, that incredible reverence and devotion and piety that you have in your heart in this traditional form of celebration of the liturgy, that's not emotion. There's no emotional component in that. Uh, to just kind of say, oh, there's no place. These aren't Catholic things, you know, this charismatic style of worship. Can there be abuses and people doing hootenanny stupid stuff, running around with banners in the church with candles and... We've all seen all that, okay? I'm not denying that there's liturgical abuses and, you know, silly stuff that went on in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and we're trying to purge the church of that stuff. But uh, to lump charismatic-style worship in with all that and festive, joyful, a different style of worship and say that's not Catholic is just, like, so rigid and narrow and restrictive restricting uh, restricted it's and kind of unbiblical in some ways i'm like really i don't know um so open the gate open the gate god our god is still with us to show his power in israel and his strength against our enemies even as he has done this day and uh they're praising god so it was my face did i already go i already went over this okay now they bang on the tambourines, and she launches in chapter 16 into this big prayer and this psalm. And uh, my favorite part is verse 9, chapter 16, verse 9. Her sandal ravished his eyes. Her beauty captivated his mind, and the sword severed his neck. <laughs> I love that. Sandal ravished his eyes, beauty captivated his mind, and the sword severed his neck. It's just like something, putting those two things together is just like violent, you know? It's like this beautiful picture of this woman, this glory, this beautiful woman, and then whack! <laughs> I had getting chopped off, you know? It's like, wow. Um, my weak people shouted. I love these words of Judith. My weak people shouted, and the enemy trembled. I love that. Let all thy creatures serve thee, for thou didst speak, and they were made. Thou didst send forth thy spirit, and it formed them. There is none that can resist thy voice. So then they arrive at Jerusalem, and they're feasting in Jerusalem for the sanctuary for three months. And many desired to marry her, but she refused, and she remained a widow all the days of her life. And she set her maid free, and she gave away and distributed all her property. So... This incredible, godly woman. 